दोस्तों अगर आप हमारे चैनल पर नए हैं तो चैनल को सब्सक्राइब करते हुए साथ मौजूद बेल आइकन को प्रेस करके नोटिफिकेशन को ऑन कर लें ताकि हर नए आने वाली वीडियोस की अपडेट आप तक पहुंच सके तो चलिए वीडियो को शुरू करते हैं So what's the day-to-day -day work of someone in IT support like? Well, it varies a ton based on whether you're doing in-person or remote support and at a small business or a large enterprise company. And there's really no such thing as day-to-day -day work since the puzzles and challenges are always new and interesting. But in general, an IT support specialist makes sure that an organization's technological equipment is running smoothly. This includes managing, installing, maintaining, troubleshooting, and configuring office and computing equipment. This program is designed to prepare you for an entry-level role in IT help desk support. You'll learn how to set up a user's desktop or workstation, how to install the computer applications that people use the most. You'll learn how to fix a problem or troubleshoot when something goes wrong, and how to put practices in place to prevent similar problems from happening again. Not only will you learn the technical aspects of troubleshooting a problem, you'll also learn how to communicate with users in order to best the system. We'll also show you how to set up a network from scratch to connect to the internet and teach you about how to implement security to make sure your systems are safe from hackers and other risks. For me, my favorite part of IT support is the problem solving aspect. I love to exercise my creativity to spin up a solution to a user's issue. Being an IT generalist also gave me the flexibility to learn and practice so many different skills and eventually determine where I wanna focus my career. Plus, when things go wrong or you fail at something in IT, you can take the feedback from those mistakes and be better equipped to tackle them the next time around. Using failure as a feedback is an important skill both in IT and in life. For me, that's why I was so attracted to the IT field. I love the process of problem solving and constantly stretching myself to learn and grow. There's also never been more opportunity to get into the IT industry than now. Not only is the field of IT incredibly diverse, but job prospects are also booming. It's projected that IT jobs in the US alone will grow 12% in the next decade. That's higher than the average for all other occupations. So what does this all mean? There are thousands of companies around the world searching for IT professionals like you. So the main gist is that IT is totally awesome and full of opportunity, and we're so excited that you're here. So let's dive right in. On July 20th, 1969, one of the most phenomenal events made its way into the history books when the Apollo 11 completed its historic mission to the moon. While the most brilliant minds helped to make sure that the Eagle had landed, computers also played a significant role. The guidance system that navigated the spacecraft was one of the earliest forms of modern computing. That same computer, the one that helped America's lunar dreams become a reality, took up the space of an entire room and had one ten thousandth the computing power of the thing that almost every one of you carry in your pockets today, a smartphone. Computer hardware and software have had such a dramatic evolution that what was once only used to power rockets now shapes the entire way our world functions. Think about your day. Did you grab a snack, turn on your TV, take a drive in your car? Computers were along for the ride, literally. Computers are everywhere. So here's the rundown. By the end of this course, you'll understand how computers work and get a grasp of the building blocks of IT. We're gonna cover the basics of how computer hardware performs calculations, and we're gonna actually build a computer from the ground up. We'll look at how operating systems control and interact with hardware. We'll take a look at the internet and get a better understanding of how computers talk to each other. We'll also spend time learning about how applications and programs tie all of this together and let humans interact with these systems. Finally, we'll cover important lessons on problem solving with computers, and cover the communication skills that are so critical when interacting with others in IT. Whether you're looking for a job in the IT industry or you just wanna learn how your laptop connects to the internet, understanding how computers work at every level can help you in your day-to-day -day life and in the workplace. But first, let's take a step way, way back, back to where it all began, even before the Apollo 11 mission touched down, so you can understand how and why we use computers today.
When you hear the word computer, maybe you think of something like a beefy gaming desktop with flashing lights, or maybe you think of a slim and sleek laptop. These fancy devices aren't what people had in mind when computers were first created. To put it simply, a computer is a device that stores and processes data by performing calculations. Before we had actual computer devices, the term computer was used to refer to someone who actually did the calculation. You're probably thinking, that's crazy talk. Uh, my computer lets me check social media, browse the internet, design graphics. How can it possibly just perform calculations? Well, friends, in this course, we'll be learning how computer calculations are baked into applications, social media, games, etc. all the things that you use every day. But to kick things off, we'll learn about the journey computers took from the earliest known forms of computing into the devices that you know and love today. In the world of technology, and if I'm getting really philosophical in life, it is important to know where we've been in order to understand where we are and where we are going. Historical context can help you understand why things work the way they do today. Have you ever wondered why the alphabet isn't laid out in order on your keyboard? The keyboard layout that most of the world uses today is the QWERTY layout distinguished by the Q, W, E, R, T, and Y keys in the top row of the keyboard. The most common letters that you type aren't found on the home row, where your fingers hit the most, but why? There are many stories that claim to answer this question. Some say it was developed to slow down typists so they wouldn't jam old mechanical typewriters. Others claim it was meant to resolve problems for telegraph operators. One thing is for sure, the keyboard layout that millions of people use today isn't the most effective one. Different keyboard layouts have even been created to try and make typing more efficient. Now that we're starting to live in a mobile-centric world with our smartphones, the landscape for keyboards may change completely. My typing fingers are crossed. In the technology industry, having a little context can go a long way to making sense of the concepts you'll encounter. By the end of this lesson, you'll be able to identify some of the most major advances in the early history of computers. Do you know what an abacus is? It looks like a wooden toy that a child would play with, but it's actually one of the earliest known computers. It was invented in 500 BC to count large numbers. While we have calculators like the old reliable TI-89s or the ones in our computers, the abacus is actually still used today. Over the centuries, humans built more advanced counting tools, but they still required a human to manually perform the calculations. The first major step forward was the invention of the mechanical calculator in the 17th century by Blaise Pascal. This device used a series of gears and levers to perform calculations for the user automatically. While it was limited to addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division for pretty small numbers, it paved the way for more complex machines. The fundamental operations of the mechanical calculator were later applied to the textile industry. Before we had streamlined manufacturing, looms were used to weave yarn into fabric. If you wanted design patterns on your fabric, that took an incredible amount of manual work. In the 1800s, a man by the name of Joseph Ricard invented a programmable loom. These looms took a sequence of cards with holes in them. When the loom encountered a hole, it would hook the thread underneath it. If it didn't encounter a hole, the th hook wouldn't thread anything. Eventually, this spun up a design pattern on the fabric. These cards were known as punch cards. And while Mr. Ricard reinvented the textile industry, he probably didn't realize that his invention would shape the world of computing and the world itself today. Pretty epic, Mr. Jacquard, pretty epic. Let's fast forward a few decades and meet a man by the name of Charles Babbage. Babbage was a gifted engineer who developed a series of machines that are now known as the greatest breakthrough on our way to the modern computer. He built what was called a difference engine. It was a very sophisticated version of some of the mechanical calculators we were just talking about. It could perform fairly complicated mathematical operations, but not much else. Babbage's follow-up to the difference engine was a machine he called the analytical engine. He was inspired by Jacquard's use of punch cards to automatically perform calculations instead of manually entering them by hand. Babbage used punch cards in his analytical engine to allow people to predefine a series of calculations they wanted to perform. As impressive as this achievement was, the analytical engine was still just a very advanced mechanical calculator. It took the powerful insights of a mathematician named Ada Lovelace to realize the true potential of the analytical engine. She was the first person to recognize that the machine could be used for more than pure calculations. She developed the first algorithm for the engine. It was the very first example of computer programming. 
An algorithm is just a series of steps that solve specific problems. Because of Lovelace's discovery that algorithms could be programmed into the analytical engine, it became the very first general purpose computing machine in history. And a great example that women have had some of the most valuable minds and technology since the 1800s. We've covered a lot of ground already, learning about how primitive counting devices like the abacus evolved into huge complex devices like the analytical engine, proof that there was life before social media. In the next video, we'll learn about how these mechanical machines made the leap into modern computing.